C5 blew up. Why? Because if you are going to build a business that requires leverage to function on a fucking 100 vol asset, you are smoking crack. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the final kind of year's episode of Raoul's Adventures in Crypto, or at least certainly the last one I'll be doing because I'm going away on holiday, finally. Well, I've just had a holiday as well, but I'm still in desperate need one. It's been kind of a hell of a year. And I wanted to recap, A, about where we are in the crypto markets, and then a lot of what I've learned this year from Rails Adventure in Crypto, I'm so blessed to be able to do this show and get the most important people in the world on it. And for such a broad range of topics from, from layer ones, layer twos, to NFTs, culture, through to hedge funds, through to metaverse. I mean, I am so lucky to be able to pick these people's minds over where the world is going and take you along with me on that journey. Anyway, it's kind of a an evening session, and so I'm going to have a glass of wine, because frankly, I deserve it, and a fireside chat and tell you what's what. So where are we in the crypto market? <clears throat> the most important thing about understanding crypto is understanding how to price it. And how I price crypto is essentially two major factors. One is global liquidity, and I use Global M2 as the main uh, understanding of that. And then there's the long, and that's the cyclical element. And then there's the technological adoption, which is the long term logarithmic trend. So let's deal with the cycle first. The cycle is what causes all of the pain. And I've been in this space since 2013, and trust me, I know pain. The first time I bought Bitcoin was at 200. It went up to, um, I think it was 1,000, then back down 85%, languished for a year or two, and then went up 10x from my entry price where I sold out. And then it came back down again after going up another 10x, then it came back down again. Um, and I've seen these cycles. And at first, a lot of people correlated them to the Bitcoin halving cycle. And I think that's probably coincidental. And it's the fact that the economic cycle works in about the same time horizon, this four-year period after 2008, that the Bitcoin halving cycle does, because it, it was born out of the crisis. And really, what I think is going on is it's the debt refi cycle, because there's so much debt in the global economy. And what happens is they try and tighten rates, and then you've got to refi all of this debt, and rates come all the way back down again, liquidity comes back. And I think the stasis, the, the natural tendency, is for there to be ongoing stimulus, because a overly indebted economy, and if you think of GDP growth being population growth, plus productivity growth. Well, with aging populations, that's out of the equation. And it seems that immigration is a political no-go, particularly with uh, real wages so stagnant. So then you've got productivity growth. Now, that's not been growing either. So the only way of funding GDP has been debt. But now it takes $3 of debt to drive $1 of GDP. We kind of get to the end game. And there's just so much debt out there, it never gets paid back. So the only way of running an economy now is allowing for the increase in debt, but what services the debt is the cash flows. So therefore, GDP growth must be higher than debt growth. If not, you need to run negative real rates. GDP growth, because of aging populations, low productivity, has come down too low to service debt growth, and therefore, you run negative real rates, quantitative easing, and other such stimulus. That is the way the world works. That was very clear in my interview with Arthur Hayes, a brilliant interview and well worth your time watching. And I think that's a key construct we all need to understand. So in the cycle, which coincides with the Bitcoin halving cycle, is the global liquidity cycle. And that's the central banks creating liquidity for the markets and for the economies. So what they tend to do is if the economy gets too hot, they tend to raise rates, liquidity comes down, they withdraw liquidity from the markets, take away QE. We've seen this several times before. And what happens is asset prices come down because they need stimulus. So once you take asset prices down, um, 
what happens is the economy starts headed towards a recession or goes into recession and the monetary easing comes back again because that's the natural state of affairs. So that's kind of how the world sets up. And right now we're in the situation where we've got massive monetary tightening. Now, monetary tightening has brought down cryptocurrencies, not as bad as they were last time, certainly not the majors. I mean, Bitcoin, ETH, you know, they got down to 70, 75%, which is, you know, ETH last time, the last cycle in 2018 was down 95%, much like Solana is now, more on that later. And Bitcoin was down 85%. So we're seeing a less dramatic timing because there's more people involved in the network, which is the growth of the network is more robust over time. We'll come more into that. So if you look at this chart here, this is the year-on-year -year global money supply versus Bitcoin. And you can see they're hugely correlated. Now, what's interesting, you see the tops of the charts, they're all missing because the scaling doesn't work. Because of the technological trend adoption, when you get the rallies, they tend to massively overshoot, even versus where liquidity is. And that extra is the extra trend that drives the markets forward over time. Now, every time we we see these trends, the boom and bust. Everybody shouts scam Ponzi. But that scam Ponzi phase is actually just driven by the monetary tightening cycle. Now, there is a lot of speculation in crypto. I get that because there is, in most new technologies, we get that in technology stocks themselves. So right now, we are at the bottom of the monetary cycle. Going forwards, we know the Federal Reserve is going to start increasing rates at lower increments. I don't think they go much further than maybe this 50 now. Maybe they try and eke in another 25 and try and keep rates stable and then wait for CPI to fall below Fed funds rates, which I ha think happens March, April. So I think next year is a game of dramatically changing liquidity conditions. Now, I also have charts to show that too. I've got charts um, of... Um, global M2, and you can see it versus ISM. ISM leads it, it's inverted on this chart, and it says when ISM starts falling, Global M2 follows and turns around. And that means because ISM is saying growth is falling, and therefore monetary liquidity needs to come back in to save and manage an overly indebted system. So that's, a, that's the typical state of affairs. We're exactly at that kind of turning point. So that's where we are on the monetary cycle. I think we will see inflation fall much faster than people expect, and therefore stimulus will come. And I think the Fed are going to think or look somewhat stupid by about June, <coughs> where I think inflation is going to be down closer to 2%. I mean, the year-on-year -year rate of change of oil prices alone is probably zero right now. And if oil goes to 60 bucks, where I think it goes, um, and we get into March of next year, that was the time from the Russian oil um, crisis premium of about $120. So oil will be down 50% year on year. That's incredibly negative for an inflationary environment. Owners equivalent rents are rolling over and eventually um, wage growth will start slowing down dramatically. So I, my bet is we'd probably get negative rates back in the end of 2023. Uh, sorry, not negative rates, uh, negative inflation, 2023, 2024. I think the uh, roadmap that we use for this is the 1940s and 50s and not the 1970s that everybody thinks. So the 1970s was the only example in history where inflation came up, came back down, didn't go all the way back down, then shot up again. I think that was driven by demographics and the Federal Reserve are fighting an old ghost. And it's not the ghost that they should be fighting. I think the more decent parallel is the 1940s to the 1950s, when everyone came out of World War II, the factories um, had to retool, so there was supply shocks, and then demand shock of everybody coming into the workforce again. Um, that drove up prices 20%. It was a bigger event than COVID. And then prices collapsed, went negative, negative 2, negative 3% year on year, then rebounded two years later, uh, we got a secondary uh, bout of inflation just from the mathematical numbers. The Fed that time around imposed yield curve control because they didn't want to raise rates and destroy the economy. I think we're going to see similar this time. Anyway, too early to tell doesn't really matter for this point. This point is we're at the low point in the cycle. I think inflation is lower. I think the crypto markets are going to be explosively better this time around. 
We're also seeing a lot of interesting things like the RSIs, weekly RSIs in Ethereum and Bitcoin are right down at levels that have always seen reversals. We're seeing it with on-chain activity. We're seeing it with minor capitulation. We're also seeing it with volatility. The 30-day um, realized vol volatility of both ETH and Bitcoin is at levels that always precedes the large rallies and the big reversals. So I've pretty much got everything in place. Is it possible to get some other down leg? I doubt it, unless something can drive bond yields high. And I just don't see that outside of a temporary blip because one of the inflation numbers or one of the employment numbers is skewed somewhat. So I don't see that happening. So I think we are moving higher. I think ETH based in June, and I've said that for several months now, in fact, since June, when I started adding to my positions. The bottom of the cycle is always the it's a scam, it's a Ponzi, all the media hates it, everybody throws shit at each other online, everybody's looking for blame, looking for scapegoats. We are exactly in that point now. It is ugly out there. And that ugliness out there is a real measure of where we are in the cycle. So we're at the despair and anger phase. And then we have the acceptance phase, which is the boredom phase, which I think we've rolled into, where prices don't do anything for a while and everyone starts getting fed up and moves on elsewhere. You can see artificial intelligence is getting people's attention just when they should be looking at crypto as well. Don't forget, artificial intelligence is not really investable for the, for the mo most of us because it's all VC, while crypto is, is, is real-time VC that we can trade, which is part of the magic of it. So we're at the blow-up phase, the FTX scandal. Now, I've seen this. I've seen it with Mt. Gox. I've seen it with uh, uh, Bitfinex. I've seen it every single bloody cycle. And this time around, everyone's like, oh, my God, it's the end of the world. Yeah, it's every time the end of the world. And guess what? It's not. It's never the end of the world. People say, well, nobody's ever going to come back into this market. Well, I've been around. I've been around the block a long time. I've been 30-odd years in financial markets. And... I've seen this with hedge funds. Long-term capital management, the biggest blow-up of a hedge fund in history, the Fed had to bail out the whole system. The, what everybody shouts at them, they're a Ponzi, they're a scam, they're over-leveraged. Hedge funds are uninvestable. Net outcome? The net assets of hedge funds went up 5x over the next seven years. Why? Regulation. Regulation appears to have cleaned up the space and then people feel much safer to come in because the institutions are waiting. And I've had conversations um, throughout Rails of Ventures in crypto, both with hedge funds like Olaf Carson Wee, um, with Jeff Dorman. I've also had it with people like Yuri and Timmer. I've had it with Sandy Call. And everybody tells us the institutions are still looking at this space. So my guess, regulation and an upswing in prices, upswing in global liquidity, and they start coming in in a more meaningful way. There tend to be momentum chasers. Um, also, we saw similar after Madoff. Hedge funds are uninvestable. They're op opaque. Nobody knows what they're about. Nobody's going to ever put money in them again. What happened? I think the hedge fund industry went up another 5x in assets under management. So that's what I'm expecting here. Regulation equals safety equals green light equals go. If that coincides with global liquidity, it creates fireworks. Um, and the market has no short positions in. It has no real ability to short unless you want to use Binance, and nobody really wants to use Binance because everyone's a bit scared of who owns it, its opaqueness, even the audits. And so, therefore, you've got very few shorts, and you've got a massive amount of money coming into the market. And stuff like ETH is deflationary the more volume there is. So the more volume there is, the less ETHs around, the more kind of reflexive in price it is. So I think we're setting up for a super interesting cycle. So I am been buying any money I can find, I'm throwing into crypto, literally in nothing else right now. Um, I'm super focused. Um, and I have been buying some NFTs. I'll come on to that in a bit. So that's where I think we are in the trend. And that's the cyclical element. Where are we in the long-term adoption trend? Well, the adoption trend, if you see this chart of, of Bitcoin, that's the log trend of Bitcoin, where two standard deviations oversold, we're the most oversold we've ever been versus trend. And we're at the point of global liquidity turning, and we've got, if you believe in it, the halving, it's all coming into place exactly at the same time. Again, 
really interesting. And here's the long-term chart, log chart of ETH. Same story, right on that big support level. And these kind of things are really interesting. The last time we got the cyclical cycle down onto the logarithmic trend or to the bottom end of the logarithmic trend was 2018, December. November, December 2018, we saw that puke, the final puke lower, which I think we saw in Bitcoin in October from the FTX, and I think we saw an ETH in June. What happened was that's when volatility um, came to the low and the market started picking up. That period, as soon as the Fed pivoted, was a complete change in markets. 2018 had seen the kind of falls we've seen now, about 20, 30% falls. It was sharp. It was nasty. Everyone was terrified. And then what happened was the Fed went, okay, sorry. Yeah, we can see the economic data is falling apart. Inflation is coming lower. So we're going to stop. And I think the S&P did about 15%. I think oil did about something similar. Um, and then the NASDAQ did about 20. Exponential age stocks, the growth technology stocks did about 24%. Bitcoin in nine months did three or four hundred percent, as did ETH. So these were staggering gains that came out of that environment. I've always referred to it like a beach ball being held underwater because the adoption trend is still there. What's fascinating about the adoption trend this time around, particularly in ETH, is the volumes have remained reasonably high. The number of active users has remained high. Um, the total value transacted, which is the other part of the Metcalfe's law equation, has actually come down as the price of NFTs has come down. But the other measures look like it's robust. 2018, we saw a much larger fall in daily active users because it was earlier in the network adoption phase. But this time around, we get to build on top of what we built on from the last cycle. So that makes me very constructive overall. So here we are on the long-term adoption cycle where Metcalfe's law kicks in, and this is the thing that drives the exponential gains. Every time we get to this situation, we get new highs within about 18 months. Uh, maximum two years. In fact, within three years, even if you bought the 69,000 high, in three years, you'll see it go through. That's how it's always worked. Would it work this time that way? I don't know, but probability is there because of this network adoption trend that we're seeing. So I'm expecting 2023 to be a decently good year and 2024 to be an extremely good year. If you remember, I said inflation, I think, goes negative. So therefore, we will see much more stimulus and growth will remain somewhat sluggish. So I'm again excited about where we're going to go. And we will go from 300 million users and next time around, we'll be at a billion users. And that, that trend rate of adoption just continues higher. So it's all to play for. And it feels always the darkest before dawn. And Christ, does it feel ugly right now. I mean, everybody hates everybody and everybody's accusing everybody of being a scam. It's um, Polini Montrachet, in case you're asking, which is my favorite white wine from Burgundy. Okay, so let's talk about this adoption and what's driving it. You see, that's what the conversations in Rails Adventures in Crypto are about. I go and choose the people I want to speak to, not who want to speak to me, not who the team tells me that I want to speak to, because I want to learn from. So I get to cherry pick everybody, and I'm in a very privileged position. So at very top level, we started with that incredible interview with Punk6529. That set the stage for how big NFTs are, because we all framed the work the last cycle around by the underlying cryptocurrencies themselves, the protocols, the layer ones, Bitcoin, ETH, Solana, etc. And 6529 made it very clear that NFTs are a much bigger deal than most people understand, because it's basically just a contract that can be used for so many different things, whether it's ticketing or artwork or music or insurance or derivatives or anything so many things. There was a big philosophy about culture and the open metaverse that I think was incredibly important because these are the foundation stones for the future. And 6529 has been one of the main proponents of that. That was a hell of a long interview, but really worth your time. The other all-time record long interview was Balaji. And Balaji talked at a broader level about these digital network states. And I've been calling them digital sovereign states and I've been talking about this for many years, and Balaji's written a great book on it. And it explains how 
in this increasingly digital metaverse driven age, we live in online communities, not just our physical communities. And those online communities can have their own system of governance, money, uh, culture, all of these kinds of things, which dovetailed in really with what 6529 was talking about. And I think those are foundationally important interviews for you to watch. I think another great one was the interview with Ian Rogers, the Chief Experience Officer of Ledger. Ian has come all the way through the internet, particularly with music and fashion. He's my go-to guy on culture. And we talked in depth about where culture plays a role and how we can think about culture and brand as intangibles on balance sheets, and they could be created into tangibles. You've seen, for example, Porsche issuing NFTs, Balenciaga issuing NFTs. We're seeing lots of big fashion brands. We're seeing sports teams. I've talked about this a lot in the past. Uh, we're seeing music artists. We're seeing so many people come into the space and use it as a new form of IP, a new way of creating the creator economy and changing the distribution of capital to the community and the artists and not to so many middlemen. Really important. And my guess is this, this whole space is going to move massively. I think that nexus of culture online community digital states um, and NFTs is going to be enormously powerful in this next run. And I think that, you know, just going to the Ledger event in Paris and to a few other crypto events, there is something about this moment in time in that where you've got music artists, visual artists, you've got filmmakers, you've got technologists, you've got financial people all coming together for this one movement. And it's magic. There's one degree of separation from everybody. It's a magic special moment in time. And it reminds me of the 1990s in the UK. 1996 was probably the year that England became the dominant cultural force in the world. And that was bookended in 1996 by Oasis headlining Nebworth. Now, it was not all about Oasis, but Oasis and British music, Oasis, Blur, Pulp, uh, and then the dance music phase that took over all of Ibiza with, you know, Carl Cox and Fatboy Slim, and then also the chill-out music that came again out of Ibiza, hybrid with the UK. Then we saw, um, you know, all of the artists like Damien Hirst and Tracy Emin all coming out of the UK everything was happening in the UK at any one time. The whole financial world was in the UK pre the Euro coming into play. It was the center of everything and you knew it. You felt it, smelt it, it was everywhere. And it was an utterly magic time. And it was probably bookended with Bowie, who is the biggest cultural icon, probably one of the biggest cultural icons of all time, headlining Glastonbury, the cultural UK iconic event. And again, incredible moment. Watch it online if you haven't seen it before. It was amazing. Um, and then all of that age of innocence and hedonism that was going on crashed into the ground, into the recession of 2000, 2001, and then ended with 9-11 and the world changed. But that's where we are now, is that moment, that moment where everybody knows everybody. It's kind of the same moment that maybe was in 2015, 14, 13, with a lot of the guys building layer ones with Vitalik and, and then people like Brian Armstrong and all of these guys, Peter Smith, they were all early adopters, early people into the space, and they all knew each other. That's where we are in the NFT cultural thing. And I think it's magnificent to watch. So just referring to my notes, because there's so much we went through. We explored NFTs in a lot of detail. And I got my friend Sergio Silva to interview people like ACK, Alf Century Kid, and OSF from Rekt Guy, two different ends of the market. Rekt Guy being a cultural asset, all about getting Rek, that liquidity cycle that goes on in crypto, and how people are still Engage, that's my rec guy behind me actually right now, is how people are still engaged in the space and how they laugh at the stories, the war stories, and how they understand that this is part of it. That's what rec guy is all about, drinking the hopium in hoping that all of the good times are going to come back again. The other side was Alpha Century Kid, and that's more serious art. 
great artists in the space. And that is this nexus we're seeing. We're seeing this community, PFPs, all sorts of stuff, crypto dick butts. And then we're seeing people, ACK, and we're seeing um, people like Fuck Render, amazing artists, ex-copy, all incredible stuff. And this nexus of people coming together is pure magic. So I really enjoyed those conversations. One of the things I've been doing also is I've been buying NFTs. I've really got interest in this space. I love the art. I love the culture. I love the excitement, as I mentioned before. But I also think of them differently. So I've got a Bored Ape and a Punk and some other kind of benchmark pieces. And the reason being is these things are down 50% from their highs. And ETH is down whatever it is, 70%. There's a bit of magic here, is these things are priced in ETH. So if ETH goes up and the price of my punk stays the same, I get all of the gains in ETH. But if my punk goes to the same high or a new all-time high, I can get a leverage upside. Now, what's the downside of my punk? Is it 25% down from here? Maybe. But if ETH's going up, it's just a bit of a drag of my versus my ETH. I've got ETH in my portfolio. So I'm just using my ETH. Now, I don't do it to a lot of my portfolio, maybe 10% or so, just to, and it's not an exact number, I'm just guessing, is really I'm doing that for the sake of getting an extra kicker. And I also like the NFT space. I'm really interested in where it's going. And I like these assets. I like the story behind them. I like how they're playing out and what happens. I want to see what Yuga Labs does. I think it's great. So it gives me an extra kicker. It's like a call option on top of my ETH position because I'm not getting rid of ETH because they're priced in ETH. A lot of people don't understand this, but really I get the ETH appreciation and I get potentially the NFT appreciation. I prefer that to staking. Because staking, I'm going to get 6%, 4%, 5% upside. And I trade off my liquidity for it. Here, I get maybe a 25% downside, but maybe I get a 4x upside versus my ETH. And I'm giving up some liquidity. But apes and punks, they're pretty liquid. So I really like this. So I've done more of that this year. And I'm getting deeper. There's my punk behind me. Um, he's a very Cayman punk. He's suntanned, got sunglasses. Um, I'm really interested in this. I want to see how this plays out. And I'm getting really interested in some of the artwork as well. And having met some of the amazing artists, I'm going to feature more of them this year. Anyway, I just wanted to add that as well. We also talked about NFTs in a broader sense with Keith Grossman. Keith, um, now, now ex-Time Magazine, president of Time Magazine, had pioneered the use of... NFTs to release old IP from the covers of time to create culture and community and moments that matter. And that was a big unlock, I think, for the film industry, the music industry, the TV industry, so many industries who have almost unlimited IP that is kind of gathering dust and nobody knows what to do with. Keith created a huge unlock. Ben Mesrich, on the other hand, we had him twice. And Ben is Again, another one of my favorite people in the space. And Ben is unlocking books and TV and movies and how NFTs can fund it, how they can move the space forward, how the crowd can participate in the making of these things, how you can fund stuff, how you can write storylines together. It's amazing what he's doing. And then he's going to build a platform to allow people, other people, to do the same kind of things as him. I thought that's really exciting. I'd love to see where that goes. The next cycle, we're going to see a lot more of this. Dan Sickles, who's not been on yet, who will be, he's filming a documentary, again, funded by NFTs, funded by the space, with the community participating. I love it. It's just magical. I love seeing new business models that are truly disruptive, and they're popping up literally everywhere. The other areas that we spent time on was stuff like the chains. So we spoke to Anatoly at Solana, and we also spoke to John Wu from Avalanche, AVAX. Two very exciting chains. I'm really interested in Solana because I think the team is exceptional in what they're doing. What they're doing is building a consumer chain. 
Now, there's a lot of naysayers about it. It's down 95%, got caught out in the whole FTX thing. But I think it's clean now because they've all had to sell it. So now you've got this chain with retail adoption, doing deals with Meta, Google, and all sorts of others. They've just done a, a deal with, um, with Discord as well. And I expect more to come from them. I think they've really understood where their place is. Having a store in Manhattan selling Solana merch is great. And the mobile phone, who knows where that goes? But I think that unlocking something big. I think the Polygon guys are too. Now, I haven't yet interviewed them myself. I think Ash has. Uh, I really want to get them on. I want to talk to them what they're up to. And John Wu from Avalanche, another super fast chain, really interesting and a big, big competitor to Solana. And he's focused on other things like real world assets. You know, he's looking at how do we tokenize property? It's another trend that's coming. It always feels like it's coming and it takes time. There's a lot of middlemen to get out of the way and a lot of legalities to get through. But that's all coming as well. And I think that's super, super fascinating. So it's really interesting to speak to the change. Now, I'm not the most technical person, but I really want to understand where this is going. Rails Adventures of Crypto is that. I'm building the building blocks of understanding of who is doing what and where is it coming from. We spoke to the Jenkins, the valet guys, and how they were building a metaverse and a and a Web3 e-reader. So they bring out the book of Jenkins the Valet, and then eventually they're creating the metaverse as well. Again, amazing. So this is this nexus with gaming coming and metaverse experiences. And obviously in gaming, we've had Yatsui, who's like one of the world's experts on this, and Pierce Kicks. And they've given us the top level of how gaming, culture, NFTs, metaverses are all coming together in something bigger. The amount of capital flowing into these particular projects is gigantic. Yes, they're expensive projects to do as well. But I think that is another thing we need to be looking out for in 2023, 2024, into 2025. We're going to see in all sorts of really interesting developments. So we've got, don't forget, also on the layer one side, we haven't had it on yet, are the Aptos guys and the Sui guys. Sui's not launched yet. Super fast, amazing chain that's come out of the um, um, come out of the Facebook uh, group who who built their entire uh, business lines there, same as Aptos. So those are two new players in the space. Um, Arbitrum is another one of the layer twos that's interesting. So lots to watch there in the traditional crypto space. Let's see how the incumbents. Let's see if the XRP lawsuit gets settled. That's going to be interesting too, and I think it cleans a lot of the space up. Regulation. We've had some shitty regulation with the library deal, but we need some clarity. XRP is going to be one of them, and then we'll get a few more tests. Who's going to regulate all of this space? Next big question. Is it going to be Gary Gensler? Is Gary Gensler going to go into a different job? Is Gary Gensler going to lose his job over FTX? Is the CFTC going to get the majority of it? I don't know. We're going to find out. But I know there's a lot of people fighting the fight here. People like uh, Ryan Selkis, uh Sensor Loomis and a whole bunch of others who are in DC, Brian Armstrong, making sure we get the right rulings and the fairness that the space requires to flourish. The US needs to regulate properly, and the and the SBF debacle proved that. Now, SBF was another person on the show and barefaced lied to us about who he is and what he does. He was basically telling us he was trying to, you know, put equities on chain and and clean up the space and buy these businesses because we need to sort this out and move forwards when what he was doing was barefaced lying because he'd gone bust and used customer money. Another extraordinary moment in time in Real Vision history where we get to see that in real time. And, you know, a bloody sad event. But typically, if you're going to build businesses in this space, you need to be regulated if you're going to take people's money. I don't care what you say. Now, DeFi is different because it's it's written into the into the smart contract how you get liquidated and how you're dealt with. It cannot be fraudulently manipulated by people. And the SBF thing, and the whole Alameda thing was rotten to the core. And we're still just finding out how extremely rotten it was. And an awful situation, but it's done. All the leverage is gone. Every leverage player has gone. So what else did we talk about? We talked about metaverse and we talked about Matthew Ball. He wrote his new book and we further examined the metaverse. 
We also looked at OnCyber, the incredible platform that Punk6529 has built his open metaverse, his OM on. Uh, amazing guy, uh, Ryan, has built this small team, amazing project. And then we had on Eric Pullier from Vatum, something that came out of the blue, who are more far advanced than anybody else, really. And that was amazing what they've done. So the metaverses are moving forward. So we've got NFTs moving forwards, different people coming in. We spoke to Jared Dicker, again, more about culture, NFTs, ticketing, music. We've seen all of that cultural phenomena coming. We're seeing the layer ones, the layer twos, the developments of that. We're seeing the institutions, the hedge funds, the adoption of that. We're seeing regulation and the changes to that. This is the picture I put together in this shitty year of 2022 where prices did nothing but go down. But it's part of the space. The global monetary and liquidity cycle is why macro matters, why macro and crypto are the same thing. But underlying it is this technology that is changing the world. And it's always at this point that people say, well, how the hell is it changing the world? There's nothing going on here except scams, shit coins, and all of that. Ignore it all. Put your fingers in your ear and focus on the bigger picture. Because the bigger picture is truly exciting to me. I think the other thing is I'm, I'm really interested how people solve UX, because UX is still terrible. I still have to call up Sergio Silva and say, how do I, how do I stake my ape? What the hell does this do? How does it work? What do, how do I connect to this and that? And how do I get my punk into my, out of, um, you know, can I buy, why can't I buy on, Meta, on OpenSea? Well, you can't, you have to go to their website. So why doesn't it, why does it want to go to a random wallet? Oh, it works that way because it's a different type of contract and it goes through the centralized wallet and then goes into your wallet. Okay. Now, why can't I see it on my ledger? Well, because it can't show on a ledger because it's a different type of contract. I mean, Christ, it's difficult. So we will see UX. I'm really interested to see um, how Ledger do in the space because I know Ian's working on a lot of stuff there. I'd love to see how uh, Consensus are doing with uh, Metamask, where the next iteration, where the Phantom Wallet goes, um, um, and also Temple. Let's see where the Tesla's ecosystem goes. A lot of people are saying, hey, listen, you've got to watch both the Solano NFT system and the Tesla's ecosystem because they're really interesting. So I think that's also worth watching. So I feel, you know, I know it's weird, but I kind of get really excited when you've had the flush out, you've taken the pain, you've got the down cycle out of the way because then you can get optimistic about the future. Now, I didn't sell any of my assets and switch them to stable coins. I learned the lesson from the last time around. So let me explain that lesson for those of you who don't know. Sip of wine first. As you know, I was in pretty early, 2013. I wrote the first ever macroeconomic strategy paper valuing Bitcoin back then too, and bought it at $200. And I put a decent sized position in. I'm like, this is the best risk reward I've ever seen in my life. I said, I think fair value is a million bucks. And let's say I'm roused a total idiot by 90%. So therefore, fair value is 100 grand. At $200, best risk reward I've ever seen in my entire career. So I bought it. Fucking genius. Raoul, you're a god. We're going to have that halo. Amazing. I rode it up. I had a long term time horizon, five to 10 years. I rode it up. It went up. Uh, it, it went up 5x to 1,000. I was like, I really am a god. You know, look at me. I'm just the best investor in the world. Then it falls 85%. I'm like, oh, well, remember the long-term picture. And that's not flipping around from being a trade to being long-term. It was long-term when I defined it and long-term as it is now. So it comes all the way back down. I kind of get a bit bored, 2014. Then 2015, it starts basing and going up again. 2016, it's going up a lot. 2017, explodes. We get the forking wars, all sorts of complications. I'd already gone through, you know, seeing bloody everything from Mt. Gox to Bitfinex to all sorts of stuff. So I'd gone through the wars, now the forking wars, uh, the ICO boom, all sorts of shit going on. I'm like, I don't know, I don't understand this. I'm going to take profits, 10x. And that was stupid because I actually traded against what I set the trade up to be, which was a long-term trade. Anyway, I've made 10x, great. It went up another 10x after that. And I remember writing on Twitter, I've got so much hate for selling out. And I'm like, listen, I don't mind if it goes up another 10x. I've made a lot of money in the trade. Everybody hated me. Then it collapsed. 
then it collapsed down 85%, down the backside again. You know, the monetary tightening going into 2018, 2018, much like 2022, a terrible year for assets. Um, everything goes down. And um, and then eventually uh, Bitcoin bases in in November, December at the bottom of the liquidity cycle when the Fed stop easing and it starts clawing higher. I'm not looking at it. Dan Tapiero taps him on the shoulder in 2019, so you've got to focus on this. And I start to refocus and I'm watching the chart pattern and eventually pull the trigger in March, April, May, June uh, 2020 at great levels and off we went to the races. So I traded brilliantly. I bought it at 200, I sold it at 2,000 or 2,500, whatever it was. I bought it back at the end of a bear market, but I bought it back averaging about, I don't know, seven and a half, eight thousand. I started at about 6,000. And then I wrote it all the way back up and all the way down here. So I think I've done pretty well. And I switched to ETH right at the right point, made a lot of extra returns, huge amounts of extra returns. So I thought, Ralph, you've done a great job. And I thought, I wonder what I'd done if I just kept my initial bet in and done nothing else, never traded it again. The answer, I would have done five times better. That was a shock to me, five times better. And I put massively more in in June 2020 than I had in 2013. So I'm like, okay, that's what really hammered home the final lesson about long-term trends. And then I thought, well, I also know this network adoption model, and I know this logarithmic trend, and I know this monetary tightening cycle. Why was if I just added the same position every time it got here? to this point in the cycle. I'd have done 25 times better. So this is why I don't trade it. So all I've been doing is letting it come down. And as soon as we've got here, I started really adding in June. And I've been adding ever since. Now, it's a recession. Nobody's got a lot of cash, uh, and nor do I. Um, but I'm doing what I can because, you know, Every time you get here, the upside is 10, 20, 30x, depending on what you're buying and where you are. And obviously, you'll get 1,000x and whatever it is, random thing. I can't pick those things ever. You're lucky if you get them. But the point being is the overall space usually does 20x, something like that. Well, 20x of a small bet, still one hell of a bet, and better than you'll get in any other financial instrument. I go away and look at this a lot because I, I just wrote my big macro thesis for Global Macro Investor. And I'm like, look, it's going to be a good year for assets. And so I think 2023, 2023 will be a good year. It might be a bit volatile, but it'll be okay. And 2024 is probably really good. So I'm like, okay, so you know, I want to buy this, I want to buy that, and I want to buy... And then I just look at the charts of all of them versus ETH. And ETH just looks like it's going to outperform. In fact, it did from the 2018 low. So it's the superior bet, whether it's volatility adjusted or outright. And I want the outright. I don't really care about the vol adjusted bet right now. I'm treating the whole lot as an option. And again, just to confirm, I don't use leverage. If I do, it's not out, um, naked leverage. I occasionally will buy options because then you can only lose your premium. So anybody who gives me bullshit about, well, you went maximum long ETH at the top. Yeah, I did. Using options, 5%. The market moves more than 5% a day. It's cheap as chips. So that's why I did that trade. I don't use leverage. I don't yield. I don't do any yield. I do do a little bit of staking, but I don't like it because you're trading liquidity. Um, and I've got income. So I can't, I don't risk more than I can lose. You know, I've got assets, I've got a house and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So so it's it's really you need to find your risk tolerance profile. For me, I've got income. Access, excess income goes into this. As simple as that. Um, and so that is my focus. I still think it's the best bet the world has ever been given. So far, it's the best performing asset of, in all recorded history. And I don't think that trend changes um, until we get to saturation of the network. And it's taken bloody Amazon, Google, all of those guys, you know, two decades, and they still haven't got to saturation of the network. So I don't think this will be a quick process either, and the gains will be long. You know, if I look at those kind of technology 
stocks, they've had something like 30 to 50% year-on-year annualized gains. Crypto has been doing about 100 and something. Again, it's twice the speed of anything we've ever seen. Now, that AI, um, the GPT chatbot thing, I mean, that's gone from zero users last Wednesday to a million users by Sunday. I mean, I think that's that AI is going to be fast. I mean, Emad's got the tiger by the tail there, but we can't participate in that. Yeah, we can play around with it, but we can't make money from it. But crypto is that. It is that asset. So it has been a shitty, shitty year. People are angry, confused, because many people came in late. People came in at higher prices. People believed that the markets only went up. They wanted to believe what everybody told them, as opposed to, I absorb all the information from people, and then I filter it into my own guise. People took too much risk. They used leverage when they were warned not to. People didn't custody, not your coins, uh, not not, uh, not your, your keys, not your coins. People didn't self-custody, just self-custody. People needed to learn the lesson because we had another couple of hundred million people who started using crypto in this cycle. And so that led to 200 million people having to learn lessons. Next time around, we'll have 300 million people starting and we'll have 600 million people, 700 million people having to learn the lesson. Um, That's just how it goes. But when you're bringing a new financial system where you can take physical possession, which is why I got into the space in the first place, because I understood you owned nothing in an over-leveraged system. And if you could self-custody your own asset, and it's a digital asset that nobody could fuck with, then you've got something amazing. If you can then build an entire um, system of value on top for the entire internet and a recorded ownership of anything, including IP, content, everything, then that is a gigantic idea. That still holds. So just use it. It's not that difficult to do. So... I am really excited. I'm really looking forward to where this is going. I'm looking forward to the conversations I have in real in in Rails Adventures in crypto and with whom and where it all goes. And what's going to play out versus what we think is going to play out. I don't know. I don't know. What is going to be the big surprise that none of us predicted? What is the oh my god, Apple iPhone moment? Because I think it's coming in crypto, where everyone goes, this is it. I'm going to use this. And it probably is something that people don't even realize. I'm really interested in what Reddit are doing with their digital collectibles. I know the Web3 hardcore enthusiasts hate it, but I don't because it's the adoption of the technology at scale. And firstly, I believe in the technology that it's a better way forwards, better for humanity, better for business models, better for creators, and better for you and I, the way that we can participate in this network. And it's that participation that I care about because we can make money too. In a world where returns are not easy to come by, particularly returns that are in excess of the expansion of the central bank balance sheets, the debasement of currency, there's very few things that do it. And I know that many of you are younger and many of you have been screwed by the system and you had student loans and you can't afford housing. And the, this is the opportunity that I think sets itself up. And I've said that in that retirement crisis video, that it's all here for everybody to to participate in. It's like a gift because all of these kind of things in the past, I'm referring to, for example, the AI. Yeah, if you're a VC investor, you need to be an accredited investor. And guess what? Mini VC investors, even if you are accredited, don't get a look into this stuff. You get all the shit at the end of the deal. It's all of the big investors. And who do they go to? Well, they go to the billionaire inner circle and the sovereign wealth funds and the pension plans who have the capital. You and I don't get a look in. But the crypto market's different. Yeah, I know VCs get some of this stuff into the space, but a whole bunch of tokens are trading below VC entry levels. There's bargains everywhere if you do your homework. Also, we haven't talked about DeFi. I think DeFi got stress tested so well in this cycle. It didn't blow up. Yes, there's still hacking. Yes, we've got problems with bridges. But DeFi and the smart contract itself worked remarkably well. And CeFi blew up. Why? Because if you are going to build a business that requires leverage to function on a fucking 100 vol asset, you are smoking crack. Because you will always go bankrupt. It's pretty much guaranteed. So for God's sake, avoid building business models on leverage. Please, everybody, stop trying to just give yield out to people 
allow staking to give yield. Don't manufacture yield from hedge fund borrowing or other participants. And if you do, make sure there's 50 counterparties, not one bloody counterparty, Three Arrows Capital or Alameda. It's crazy. Uh, but we will get there. It's the growing pains. We all have to learn the hard way. We learn what business models work, what doesn't work. We did that in 2001 in the dot-com. What rose from that was something even bigger than any of us expected. So good luck out there. Have an amazing holiday. Get some time off. Detune. Don't stay on Twitter. Stop flinging poo at each other. Stop blaming people for your losses. Just be nice to each other because it's stressful for everybody. But we've got to be in this for the long term. This game is about surviving. It's not about blame. You've got to take responsibility for your own trades, your own self-custody. You need to take responsibility for the leverage you take. What exchanges you use. You're all smart enough to do that work. We will be there always at Real Vision to help you, to give you the information. But we're not there to guide you. Now, my opinions are my opinions. They're not the opinions of Real Vision. Now, I can be wrong. I've been wrong many times in my life, and I've been very right many times in my life. I am not a guru. I'm not somebody you hang on to every word of and copy what I do. So please learn how to assimilate information, digest it, create your own view, and have your own confidence. Understand how much capital you're risking in the right way for you. When you do that, you will unlock your own superpower. Anyway, thank you for being with me on this journey this year. Raoul's Adventures in Crypto, I think, is the most amazing crypto show in the world. Nobody else in the space, honestly, I'm not blowing my own trumpet, gets the broad range, depth, breadth of incredible interviewees than this show. And that's a testament to all of you that are huge supporters of Real Vision, what we do, support me online. And that allows me to have access to the world's most brilliant people. So thank you as well. Thank you for being part of this. Also, don't forget the Real Vision Genesis um, NFT. And I'm not shilling it. I don't care. You know, I'm not trying to drive the price higher, but I'm telling you something, which is that is the genesis of which we are building out all of our Web3, much like the Bored Apes were for Yuga. So pay attention to that, because we've got a lot of Web3 initiatives coming. We've got fantasy trading leagues. We've got, we're going to try and even tokenize crowdsource asset management. We've got, um, you know, I think we're going to tokenize education credentials. We've got an enormous amount to come. We're working towards the Real Vision token as well to create a utility token for our ecosystem, maybe a closed system like Reddit at first so we can build a proper economy. It's all coming. So we are in this for the long run. We will have metaverse experiences. We're working hard on that as well. We're in this Web3 journey for the long run because Web3, macro, they are the same thing. These are not different worlds. They're the same world. It's just the future of the old world on different rails in a more efficient way. So I don't want to see the fighting that people have because it's something they don't understand. Technology is coming whether you like it or not. And I showed that with the artificial intelligence interview and in the interviews about space that I did with Leon Alkali. This shit is happening. So let's embrace it. Let's revel in the beauty of being part of a revolution, a cultural, financial, technological revolution and we're at the beginning, and you can follow me in my journey as I figure out what the hell is going on. Take care out there. Hey, visionaries. Thank you for tuning in. For more free crypto content like this, head over to realvision.com forward slash crypto. You'll get early access to the most brilliant minds in the space to cut through the noise, get in-depth analysis, and get you ahead of the curve with unbiased insights.